Good afternoon. Uh, the Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 12.07. Our next case is Mr. Zamario Douglas. Mr. Douglas, would you give us your full name and DOC number, please? Zamario Zontel Douglas, 36-9182. Mr. Douglas, uh, let me explain our process. Uh, first, I'm going to read some information into the record. Then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you at the appropriate time. We will uh, allow those persons who've indicated they wish to have input to speak. Speaking on your behalf today is your wife, Susan Douglas, and speaking in opposition uh, is Tr Tori Mathern, who is one of the victims in this case. Uh, at the end, uh, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our procedure? Yes, sir. This is the matter of uh, Zamario Z. Douglas. Uh, DOC number 369182, date of birth April the 12th of 1979, is classified as a third felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of April the 11th of 2024, an adjusted good time date of September the 16th of 2026, and a full term date of July 1st of 2032. He is currently serving a 31 year, 10 month, and five day sentence on the charges of three counts of armed robbery, unauthorized entry of an inhabited dwelling, unauthorized use of a mover, and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle, uh, having been revoked on those three last charges. Uh, is that all sound pretty accurate to you, Mr. Douglas? Yes, sir. Mr. Douglas, uh, your case has been assigned to me, so uh, I will begin the interview process. Mr. Douglas, how old are you, sir? 44. And Mr. Douglas, uh, how long have you been in prison on these charges? Um, almost 23 years. Mr. Douglas, uh, I'm a little confused by your prison record, so I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions, okay, about that. Then we'll talk a little more about the interview. Uh, you were in prison when you were 17 years old, or at least your first three crimes were when you were 17, 1996. Those were the charges of, I uh, believe you pled guilty to unauthorized entry of an inhabited dwelling, uh, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle, and uh, another unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Uh, you were given supervised probation on two, and then you were given five years on the other. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. How long did you actually stay in prison on those three charges? Three years and two months. Okay. During those three years and two months, how many write-ups did you have? I have no idea. Was it a lot? Because my records reflect that you have lost 598 days of good time. And it doesn't appear that you lost any or much of that good time while you've been in prison in the last 22 years. How much good time, how many disciplinary write-ups have you had in the last 22 years? 22 years. Maybe these records are inaccurate. Uh, Mr. Maribel, am I to answer that question? Yes, ma'am. If you can get a little closer to the microphone, we're having a little difficulty hearing you. But yes, I'd love you to answer that question. Okay, his first incarceration, let's see, you asked that question, he had, had a total of 40, uh, 39 write-ups, the first incarceration. The, since he's been back this time, since 20, or 2000, excuse me, he's had a total of uh, 78. What was sent to the parole board was a mistake. They only put one write up on there or have one right. write up conduct yeah. report. So actually, his total is 78. And with okay. the last one being June the 23rd of 22. And what was that write up for? That was a 30C and a three. That was while he was at a parish. No, actually, I'm sorry. That was while he was at DCI. Okay. And the 30 was what? So, Do you have any information on that, right? What, specifically yes. facts? Yes, sir. It I happened, it was at a parish. I think DCI wrote him up. Is that correct? Well, I know the warden wrote me up at the um, 
Oh, it was at De Quincey Police, Police Department. Department. Okay. And it, it was, uh, he arrived at the jail at the end of the work day. All offenders were searched and entered the cell block. Um, entered the shower first. Offender Douglas got very angry. And our, do you remember this? Ontario became, he had gotten into the shower before him. Douglas pulled the shower curtain, opened the door, and he stated F you. He had closed it again, and Ontario was, uh, he's no, no better than anyone else. Douglas was very hostile toward the offender, uh, Ontario, and Warden uh, Trevor opened the cell block and asked the offender Douglas uh, what the problem was. I guess he had an altercation with another offender uh, at this time, and then um, on, that was on June the 23rd. On June the 25th, uh, he had a visitor, and let's see. Douglas had many uh, bat, or excuse me, Susan uh, Douglas had many bags with her. I asked her if she had the bags. Uh, Susan Douglas told me nothing but food and and snacks. I then walked her into the office and and myself searched her bags and located in the wrap in the bottom of the bag. Uh, was a cell phone and told her to leave visitation and offender Douglas also became very uh, arguing with me and then told offender Douglas to go back into the cell block. Susan Douglas was then arrested on a warrant of introduction of contraband. That was those two incidents were seen from that last write-up. Was there any uh, any action taken on the arrest for the write-up for the contraband? I'm not sure about that, sir. Sure. Mr. Douglas, what happened on the contraband arrest? My wife came to see me while I was having a picnic visit. She uh, had been coming to the jail for about four months to see me. And every Saturday and Sunday, we have picnic visits for six hours. Um, her cell phone was in her bag, but she had been bringing it in for about three weeks. About three weeks. And she said that the car was getting too hot. And so when she go back to the car, her phone wasn't coming on. So she started to bring it in. And it was no problem. She had been doing it for three weeks. Um, you, got, you got arrested for contraband. What happened on that charge? No, he didn't, didn't get arrested. The, the she, did. Got she got arrested for the contraband. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you know what happened with her? Um, she's, still, she's still going to court on it. Oh, she is? Martin, can I ask you another question? Yes, um, where, where, uh, was this previous write-ups uh, before the 22 write-ups? Um, I think the it was 16. May of 16. May the 18th of 16, he had a... Okay, uh, so he went six years before he got those two write -ups. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. All right, I'm sorry. It's okay. No, no. I it, it it was very confusing. Yes. I was trying to figure out uh, how it is. Uh, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, when you were seventeen years old, Mister uh, Douglas. Yes, uh, when you got your uh, other charges, the burglary, you were arrested for burglary, unauthorized use of the motor vehicle, and the stolen vehicle. Uh, how far had you gone in school at that time? Did you finish high school? No, sir. At 17, you were 17, right? If my math is correct. You were 17 when you got arrested? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's talk about you at 17 years old. Were you still in school? Yes, sir. And uh, what grade were you in? I was in alternative school going to get my GED. All right. Why were you in an alternative school? Because I dropped out of eighth grade. Okay. So you quit the eighth grade? Yes, sir. Who were you living with? My mother. So tell me what you were doing at 17 years old. Why, why, why the burglaries? Why the stolen vehicles? Why, uh, why were you doing what you were doing? Really and truly, I... Um, just being out all all night, um, doing everything that I shouldn't have been doing. We doing drugs? 
Yes, I smoke marijuana. Yes, sir. Uh, how how when did you start smoking marijuana? Not about two years prior, when I was about fifteen. Okay. How often were you smoking marijuana? Um. I remember when I first started, it was just every so often, maybe every time I get three or four dollars to buy me a joint. Okay. And did that progress to more often? Yes, sir. How often? Um, probably every day. When you were 17 years old, when you're getting all this trouble, were you smoking marijuana every day? Yes, sir. Any other drugs? You ever use cocaine? No, sir. Only marijuana. Only marijuana? What about alcohol? No, I never could keep anything down. So every time I drunk, I always vomited. So I never drunk alcohol like that. Now, in in the uh, 78, I, I believe, let me see, I wrote it down. I can't remember where to put it. In the uh, 78 write ups that you've had since you've been in the last 23 years. Have any of those been alcohol or drugs? No, sir. When was the last time you smoked marijuana? When I was on the street in 2000. So when did you get out? Uh, you went to prison for three plus years, you told me. Uh, when you got out, what, in 2000? Yes, sir. January the 17th, 2000. Okay. And then you went right back to crime. Why? No, I did. Uh, actually, I stayed out for a while for a couple of months anyway. And I did my best um, to try to find me a job. Um, I was willing to, to work anywhere. I put in applications everywhere I could think to put in applications and uh of course I who, never got who were you, you by my calculation what are you 20 you were 20 21 maybe I was 20 when I came home okay so when you came out where were you living um if the first week I lived with my mom and after that I moved in with some guys that I grew up with okay same guys you were doing all the other stuff with no sir I had never um they were younger than me so we we never was Hang on, marijuana smoking. smoking. Go back to smoking marijuana. Oh, yes, sir, I did. I started smack, smoking again. You smoking every day like you were before? Um, yes, sir, I sure did. All right. So tell me how you got involved with the the Jiffy Mart, uh, Chevron, and the car that you stole. Um, I I, I want to say I was with the wrong people, but at the same time. Nobody made me do what I did. I did that. That was, you know, I did that on my own. Um, nobody held a gun to my head. Um, now that you look back, why were you doing those things? I, the man, I, I'm, I ask myself that a lot because the, the man that I am now, I just, I can't even believe that I actually did that. Like, I can't see myself actually doing that, not the guy that I am now. But now, I mean, do you believe, I, let me ask you this do you believe that drugs may have had something to do with that? It's easy, it would be easy for me to say yes, but I would be lying to you if I told you that when I did that, that I was on the influence of drugs. I wasn't. Were you smoking every day? Yes, I still was smoking, but I know that, like, when I did the actual crimes. I was not on anything. I, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting, uh, Mr. Douglas, that you were insane or legally uh, exonerated from your crimes because you were not in your right mind. My, my question to you is, do you believe that smoking marijuana every day contributed to the crime that you committed? I can go with that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you consider yourself, as you sit here today, back then and today, do you consider yourself to be an addict, a drug addict, a substance abuse addict? Yes, sir. Um, I will always be a recovering addict. Always be. Now, 
Let's talk about what you've done since you've been in prison. Let's talk about you uh, after uh, 23 years in prison. Tell me a little bit about your education. Did you finish school? Did you get your GED? Yes, sir. I got my GED right here, David Wade. Okay. Uh, what other educational things have you done? Uh, Educational-wise, the only other thing that I did was the one thing that I felt like I was passionate about was cooking. I always wanted to be a cook. So um, I got into the kitchen, you know, numerous times in numerous different facilities as a cook. Um, and finally, when I was at Allen Correctional Center a few years ago, I enrolled in culinary. And um, I stayed in culinary for about almost three months. But at the time they came in and they had a new superintendent that came in and took over the program and everybody who had a certain amount of time, they dismissed us from the class to put people in who were about to go home. So that's how I lost out of culinary right there. And I think that maybe they gave me some partial credit, but I never got a chance to finish because, excuse me, a couple of months after that, they shut the program down completely. What kind of programs did you take that you think were very helpful to you? Um, substance abuse. I took substance abuse a couple of times um, in the past. Um, anger management, I took that because I felt like I needed that. Um, I took a couple of other things like um, smoking cessation. I took that here at David Wade also. I don't think that's anything that showed up in my record, though, but I took it here. Um, I, I see that you enrolled in uh, victim accountability training. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me what that was about. And tell me what, what your thoughts are to the people that you victimized. I mean, uh, what do you think a person thinks when someone pulls a gun on them? Wow, that's big. Do you big, think that uh, affects them for the rest of their lives sometimes? It does. It, it, it does. I mean, because I can see what it has done, I can see what it did to me. And I'm the person who did it, you know, cause I, I also have to live with that too. So I know that it affected them even more so than it did myself. It, I mean, I, I, like I can go back and say, I still can't believe that the man that I am now, I just can't believe that I, I did that back then. I, I can't, I mean, I know I did. You've taken Malachi Dads, Partners in Parenting. Uh, you're married. Your wife is here today to speak on your behalf. Do you have children? Yes. I um, found out in 2015 that I had a daughter. And um, she's 22 now. Do you have a relationship with that daughter? Yes, I have a I have a great relationship with my daughter. She come to visit you? Um, she was for a chance, but she isn't right now. But um, we still speak weekly. You have a lot of letters of support. Uh, you, uh, your, your, your disciplinary record is is it's pretty bad. Uh, you've done, you know, you 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 did okay for uh, for five years, and then all of a sudden, uh, twenty, whatever that was, twenty twenty two, what happened? Tell me, tell me why the, the the disciplinary issues? Because that's something that we significantly look at. Okay, so um, like the word was saying um on the write up for the rule three, we went to work. Uh, we was all working on the street, Class A trustees. Uh, we're out cutting grass um, in the city of De Quincey. And there's two showers. There's 12 guys. And so when we get in, it's always a, a race to the shower. But we respect each other enough to, to say that whoever calls the shower first, that's who gets in. And so there's only two showers. So that particular day I got in and I was one of the first ones who got searched. And so I said, I want the first shower. 
And so everybody heard me, we was all in the room together. And so when I came down the hall, the thing that I did was I opened the shower curtain, turned the water on, I took my shirt off and I hung it on the shower nozzle. That lets people know that I'm next in the shower. And so my, my cell was all the way at the end of the hall. So the guy, Artigo on the right up, his cell was one. He came down the hall directly after me. But you keep in mind that there's two showers. He went into his cell because he came right behind me and I had, all, I had to go all the way down to cell five. He went into uh, his cell, I got undressed real quick and ran into the shower. So when I came back up the hall, somebody was in the shower. I had no idea who it was. And so I, I asked him, I said, who's in the shower? He said, I'm in the shower, this ought to go. And I said, man, I had shower first. I called the shower first. And so he and I started talking back and forth through the curtain. And I told him, because he's been there longer than me. As a matter of fact, he had been there longer than everybody. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I felt like he felt like he was more privileged than us because he had been there longer. And I only been there for about four months myself. And I just let him know that he wasn't better than everybody else, that he should have to wait in line like everybody else. And so we did get loud with each other. But the defiance part, I don't curse at all to nobody. I mean, I'm not blaming, but it was I didn't curse nobody. It was an argument. It was loud, but I never cursed him out. And as far as the write up about the contraband or the, the rule 30, my wife did bring her phone. She brought her own registered cell phone in to herself. She brought it in. And she told me why she brought it in. She told me when she started bringing it in, why she was bringing it. Because you know, she said she's leaving it in her car and her car was getting so hot because this, this was the summer and her car was getting so hot. So then when she leave, because visitation is six hours and she's in there for the whole six hours. And when she go back to get in her car, you know, it would take an hour or so for her phone to come on from being so hot. So she started bringing it in. So that particular day, when she brought her phone in, they found the phone in her bag. I mean, that's registered her. You know, it wasn't, he just made it yeah. seem. All right. we've, they, they, we we've it. explained that. We've got right. that. So right. Tell me about all the other write-ups before that. I mean, you've had a ton of write-ups. You've lost 598 days of good time. That's a, you know, that's that's a lot of good, you know, you'd be, you, you'd have a good time date of a year sooner if you wouldn't have done all of that. So tell me what all that was about. Oh, just being recalcitrant, just being hard at it, you know, just being um just being hard at it, you know, just not doing what authority told me to do, you know, trying yeah, to has that change now. Absolutely. Yes, sir. How, how has it changed? Because I know that what I need, I know what I need to do in order to make it, you know. Every day that I go to my dorm, you know, at night, you know, the, the main thing that I do is I pray that I'm a better man today than I am, that I was the day before, you know. When, when did you get that enlightened? When, when did, can you pinpoint approximately when, hey, look, the light came on. This is, this ain't working. I got to do something else. I'm no, tired of this time. When, when, when did that happen? Well, actually, when I, I went to Allen Correctional Center and um, a friend of mine, you know, a guy who I used to get in trouble with at Winfield Correctional Center, um, I seen him in a faith-based program. And when, when would that have been? And that was in 2016, no, 15, 14. I got in faith-based 2015. And... Um, and that's about the time all your disciplinary issues, other than what we just talked about, quit. Yes, sir. And so that's that's when I I changed everything around. Okay. So tell me how you're going to stay sober if you're released and get out. No, you haven't. You know, don't tell me. Well, you know, I haven't smoked anything in 20 years. Uh, we both agreed early on that you're. 
a recovering, a recovering addict. Yes, sir. Addict. So, so how how will you make sure you don't go back to that lifestyle? I don't. I, I don't know. I I just know that I'll never. I like. I know that I'll never do drugs again. Like well, I, I believe as you sit there, you believe that. Yes, sir. My question to you is, you've taken some probes, you said. You've taken Celebrate Recovery. You've taken some substance abuse probes. What have you learned in those programs with regard to what your triggers are? What is it that, that happens to you that makes you gravitate towards marijuana? And, and how would you stop that? What 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 are your what is your plan to make sure that you don't go back to doing that? And, and, and I, I believe you when you say I ain't gonna do it no more. But you know, when you get out, life's gonna suck. You you might lose a job, you might go for a job interview, and you might not get it. Someone in your family might get sick, things happen. How are you gonna be able to resist? Smoking a little marijuana just to feel better. You're well, getting right back in the same crack. During substance abuse, one of the things that I did realize is like some of my triggers. And the main trigger that I had was being around certain people. Because a lot of time I went around those people and I had no intentions of smoking or getting high. But if they smoked, then I would automatically smoke with them. That's that's my point. So right. tell me what tools you're going to put in place to make sure if you run across those people. Now you may want not to, but there gonna be times you're gonna run into your whole crowd. So tell me what you're gonna put in place to make sure when those things happen, you're gonna be prepared. I don't know. I I I, I pray a lot. You know, I just. I keep my wife in mind, I keep my, my daughter in mind, my mother who's 69 years old. I just know that nothing out there, smoking marijuana or hanging with my old crowd is important anymore. I know that my commitment now is to my family. You know, that is what's yes, Mr. Douglas, Douglas, let me stop you just for a second. I was a drug court judge for 14 years and I heard everybody say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I can't tell you how many of those people I buried because they were too confident. They thought they had it licked. They didn't realize that it was a disease that they had and they had to have treatment all the time. Now, you mentioned something about classes. Did you learn anything about the 12 steps, about AA? about getting a sponsor, anything like that? Yes, I learned about getting a sponsor. Um, I know that um, in AA, the, one of the, the, the main things, the first step that I learned was, you know, uh, admitting that I was powerless over it. You know, and I know that I know that I needed help, you know, and that was the reason that I took the classes. That's the reason that I'm still, right to this day, I still go up and talk to my counselor, right to this day, you know, because I understand that I need help. I'm not that nowhere. That's my question to you. I'm asking you very simply: If you get out, what are you going to do to maintain? You're going to you're going to stay sober. Oh well, you my wife. You didn't mention the first thing about a counselor. You didn't so, mention the first thing about a sponsor. You didn't mention the first thing about an AA meeting. You I'm know, sorry. so well, I'm, well, my question is, why not? That's, that's one of the first that's... thing you learn when you understand you're a drug addict. You know that you have to go to meetings, otherwise you're going to fall. Going to fall. That's one of the. You main... didn't tell me that, and that concerns me. Okay, that's one of the things that my wife and I have talked about. You know, because she is she's she's so supportive, and even though she's never did drugs or alcohol. She's already, you know, told me that those things like that, she's going to do them with me. You know, like AA or NA, she's already told me that she's going to be willing to come with me. You know, even though she doesn't have a problem like that, but she's going to support me enough.
to be right there with me in the meetings. Well, what, let's talk a little bit about your transition plan. Where are you and your wife going to live? Um, by the grace of God, um, I'm going if, you know, if whenever parole is granted, today or whenever, um, I'm going to do my best to get a transfer from Louisiana to New Mexico where my, my wife lives. In That's where your wife is in New Mexico? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, I, I want to drive trucks. You know, I want to get into somebody's school to learn how to drive trucks, get my CDL and um, drive trucks and um, get with my parole officer to see if, I, if I'm if i able to do it across country or across state or just locally. You know, and even if that falls through, the worst, worst I, I'm a hell of a cook. I know that I can go and get a, a, a cook job anywhere. Have you done anything to look into transferring your parole to, to New Mexico? I've talked to my classification officer here and she has already told me that, um, you know, the process of it, you know, I've talked to her about it. She's already told me the process of it. Um, and it's just gonna, I just have to wait on the process. Okay, now your parole eligibility date is not until April. Yes, Are sir. You programs currently, but it looks like you maxed out on your good time. Uh, are you in any programs currently? Yes, sir. What are you in right now? I'm still. I'm doing living in balance right now, and I'm also in victim awareness. Gordon, what can you tell us uh, about uh, Mr. Douglas? Uh, Mr. Douglas came to us right after that incident at De Quincey, uh, and he has not had any more write-ups or disciplinary he's not a disciplinary problem here at wade um he uh, like he said he's currently enrolled in those two programs he has completed some uh like got his ged here and um let's see what's his trustee status he is uh medium custody right now the job he has, he was in the North Kitchen and, and now he's on uh, a, a crew, crew one, just a, a work crew. So he has had some of the uh, forfeiture of good time restored, 270 days of that restored. And like you said, he's earned his max CTRP credit. Okay. So. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Anybody? Okay, now we'll hear from. Uh, your wife, Ms. Susan Douglas, Ms. Douglas. Yes, I'm sorry, I had to unmute my mic. It's okay, can you hear us? What was that? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, okay. thank you. If you'll introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know. Yes, I'm um, Zamario's wife. We've been together almost four years this coming November. Um, I know that he's a changed man. I know that he made mistakes in the past, but I can see a great future for him um, to get rehabilitated out here and, you know, in our society. And he's got a great support with family and lots of friends out here waiting to help him and, and support him in every way that he can. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Tori Mathern. Yes, hello. Um, I would like to start off by thanking the parole board for allowing me to come and speak today. Um, when I received the letter um, about this incident, um, you know, the, the word, seeing the word victim written in print had a pretty big impact on me. Um, I, I never did get to initially participate in the um, in the justice process when this all first happened. It was many years ago. I'm one of Mr. Douglas's early victims and I lived in a dorm full of girls and we never, I never did find out how he got a hold of the, key, the keys of my car. I can only tell y'all that I know that um, I went out one night I woke up the next morning and my keys were gone and I went out to the parking lot and my car was gone. So, you know, I, I was victimized on a couple of different levels. It wasn't just that my car was stolen, but 
somebody had to find a way to get their hand to come into a dorm full of girls and put their hands on on my keys. Um, other than telling the police that at the time, I never did get to participate, like I say, in the court system and say that out loud. And when I got this letter in the mail, it just felt important to me that I get my voice out there because all these years later, I'm still considered a victim. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And we appreciate uh, your being here. And uh, we hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Douglas, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Uh, I just want the board to know that um, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for what I did. I had no business doing it. I mean, I was wrong in every way. I was wrong. I did some 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 stupid stuff. I did some horrible stuff. That is not who I am, though. That's the the man I am. That's not me today. You know, that's not me today. Uh, I told my wife this, and um, she just she doesn't believe me because she met me like this. This I'm the guy that she met. She didn't meet. She didn't know me 20 years ago. And I tell her often that had we met 20 years ago, she wouldn't have fell in love with me. And she wouldn't have wanted anything to do with me. And so I thank God that um, she got to meet this man. And so um, I'm glad that y'all got to meet this man too. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Douglas, I appreciate your comments. Uh, family ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Douglas, uh, let me say that I, I have enjoyed our interview. I think you've been very honest with me. Uh, I, I think that uh, you're well-spoken. I, I think that uh, maybe having been a prosecutor, a defense lawyer, used to cross-examining people over the years, uh, maybe uh, my questions weren't uh, perhaps appropriate enough for you to be able to explain to me what your sobriety plan is. I believe you do have a, a, a sobriety plan. I think you have a knowledge of what you can do to make sure you don't go back to doing drugs. Uh, you were 17 years old when you began uh, your crime, uh, and you've paid uh, a long price. Uh, after you got out, you went back in. You've been in for 23 years. Uh, the good news is that no one was physically injured in, in your incidences. Uh, obviously, people have emotional scars, but uh, you've served your time well. Uh, you've had a lot of disciplinary issues. You've had a lot of problems uh, in prison, apparently. Uh, but I do believe you when you say that sometimes around 2015, 2016, like and, uh, you know, I'm not sure what I would have done with Zamario Douglas at 20 years old. But I got a good feeling what I would do to Zamario Douglas today at 42. So having seen all of that, having heard all of that, my vote would be to uh, grant your uh, parole. Uh, I would like to see you go to New Mexico. Uh, you've got a little bit of time before you'll be able to get out on parole. So I hope that you go through ICOTS and get uh, transferred to New Mexico. Uh, and when you get there, uh, I'm going to, uh, once you get out, uh, my conditions would be that you go to at least three AA meetings per week. Uh, and for at least the first uh, six months, and then your parole supervisor can make a decision as to how often you want to, you should go after that. Uh, I'd also like to see you uh, do about five hours of community service work, perhaps uh, uh, maybe three months after you're out, especially talking to young people uh, to tell them your story. Uh, I think you've got a lot of things to say about what you've been through. I think you might be able to help people in the future. Uh, so that's my vote, and uh, good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Ms. West? 
Douglas, um, you you uh, you presented yourself well today. When I was reading your case last night, I I, I had some I had some concerns. You you came across sincere to me. Uh, <clears throat> I do want you to know that in reading some of the victim statements, some of them said that the crime impacted them in ways that changed their life forever. It changed how they trust people. So I want you to realize the four reaching impacts of your acts on, on those individuals to this day. Um, I'm inclined to take a chance on you. I, I concur with uh, Mr. Marabello. Uh, my vote is the same for the same reasons. I would like to see random drug screens uh, over your period of supervision. Uh, best wishes to you, sir. Okay, Mr. Douglas. Uh, I also uh, go along with my colleagues and I, I'm gonna vote to grant. I just want to tell you, it looks like you could earn about another 90 days of good time, which you probably will with these two classes. So I would suggest come around December or January, y'all put in for that interstate compact where you won't be sitting around here waiting to go. Okay? Yes, sir. You have three votes to grant your uh, parole. Good luck to you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. That was a great interview. That was a refreshing, um, really a wonderful interview. And, and, and it's, it's crazy that he got so much time. The, the, the hearing right before this was of a man who had done the most horrible things to his, to his daughter. And he got 15 years. And uh, what was really disappointing about this hearing for me what was really disappointing about this hearing was I was hoping, I was really hoping that Tori, the, the victim, was gonna say something at the end that would have been to show some sense of humanity. Her car was stolen over 20 years ago. She wasn't in the car. She feels violated that he he is she assumes that he went into her dorm room and took the keys. And you show up after the man sat in a prison cell for 23 years and you feel that you you have and it, I thought that maybe there'd be some sense of humanity at the end of it where she said, you know, I wanted to get that off my chest and share how it have affected me, but I really, it's really amazing to see how well he's done. And I'm, I hope that you can parole him. I, I, I was hoping that would happen. I don't think we've ever seen. It's, it's, it, it, you know, uh, like a really strict kind of rule. We don't, there's absolutely no victim blaming here. But this is just something I can't wrap my mind around. You, you're, you know, who knows? Maybe you left your keys on the floor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, even like, it's like, you want to, what do you want? You want to see him. I mean, she didn't say she wanted to see him locked up more, but I just, I just can't wrap my mind around that. I can't see. Can you imagine spending all those years locked up for, for nonviolent offenses? Um, when it's when the hearing started off with his wife, I said, Oh no, this is off to a really bad start because they're mentioning her name with the contraband and the phone. And I look in the zoom and it's her and I'm like, Oh, this is it. This is it. He's done. He's not, he's not going anywhere. Um, but I mean, it ended up turning up that it was, it was her phone. It, he wasn't smuggling it in. I mean, she, 
you know, she lied and said that it uh, it wasn't there, and then they decided to charge her, and now she has to deal with that. But hey, I know what she means about a hot phone. A phone gets really hot. You leave it in the car. It's crazy. You, uh, it's not good for the phone. You do have to wait for it to cool down before you turn it on. I have my phone overheat if I just have it in the 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 window thing, you know, in the little phone holder with the GPS on. It will overheat after a few hours in the sun, even with the air on. So. Uh, I didn't know that they had picnics though. That's that's actually really cool. So you get married, you get to have a six hour picnic and I don't blame him for being upset that that was taken away. He probably looks forward to it for so long, but now I had no idea that you can do that uh, at Angola. And well, they're not Angola, um, but that you can do that there. And I also like, I thought it was great. Mr. Marabella took a step back and he said, you know, I could have asked the questions differently. I do think you have a plan. That's a, That was also really uh, refreshing to see. You know, I, I love seeing that because it was true. It's, it, I didn't feel like we, we, we've seen, we've seen uh, hearings where the person starts just like saying things about their their sobriety plan and then they kind of change their mind when they realize they made a mistake and i i do think it was the line of questioning he does have uh, a plan and it was just in the way that it was that it was asked and mr marabella retracted it and and said that you know i, I do believe you um it was interesting too he's like i don't curse uh which is something that i tried very hard not to do as well um so i connected to that and I mean, to be able to, to not curse and, and being locked up, that's, I mean, it's just, he, he just really impressed me. Um, I was really impressed and blown away with the interview. And I don't have any records. There's nothing, even though he has a, a unique name, when you Google it, nothing comes up. And it's just, it was, it was interesting. He, uh, didn't seem to be even an addiction problem that was driving him to doing this from the beginning of the hearing, but just an, an interesting person. Um, but let's jump into to the next one on that note, right? Well, down Florida down. Okay, uh, we're ready. It's 1254. The committee on parole is called back to order. Uh, is uh, Are y'all ready on uh, Mr. Uh, Carlos Lewis? Yes, sir. Here he is, right here. Okay, good. Good morning, Mr. Lewis. How are you? How are you? How are you? Very good. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, would you give us your full name and DOC number? Carlos Jerome Lewis, uh, 10292. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. Then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those persons who wish to have input to speak. You have uh, several people here that are willing to speak on your behalf. Your mother, Ms. Joyce Lewis your sister, Ms. Sharian Brown, and a minister, Michael Mims. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process, sir? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Carlos T. Lewis, the DOC number 102982. Mr. Lewis was born on April the 30th of 1963. He's a sixth felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of November the 22nd of 2022. He's not eligible for good time, uh, and he is currently serving a life sentence on the charges of attempt, attempted distribution of cocaine after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Is that information basically correct, uh, Mr. Lewis? Yes, sir. Mr. Lewis, your case has been assigned to Ms. Cole. She will begin uh, our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? All right. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for asking. 
Uh, call out for the record, sir, how long you've served on this on this life sentence? Uh, 15 years and uh, Okay, close enough, close enough. Yeah, about, uh, yeah 15, close. Eight, about 15 years and eight months. Okay, all right. Okay, and uh, the I'm, records I have show that you are a sixth offender and you are 60 years old today, right? Yes. How long of those 60 years would you say you spent in jail of your lifetime? Ooh, about shoot, over half, I think. About 30 of them? Uh, at, least, at least 30. Uh, okay. This is the longest time you've been in jail yeah, and would stretch. Go ahead. Yeah, about, about 30 years. About 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is this the long longest time you spent in one stretch? Yes. 16 years? Yes. yes you sure? You sure? Yeah, it's the longest stretch. Uh, the uh, I actually been I, I actually been incarcerated uh, a little over seventeen years. I got I got locked up in uh actually I got locked up in uh oh six in May oh six. See, that's what was confusing to me. Uh, so you you've been in jail since May of oh six. Yeah, ma'am. But the uh, you you only had thirteen days of credit on sentencing in oh seven. That's what kind of throws me off. Okay. In May of 06. Yeah, they, uh, I, they, uh, they, I had, I was on parole when I got locked up. Mm -hmm. So they put all that other, uh, uh, that other time toward my parole credit, my parole okay. registration credit. Uh, okay, because your arrest is showing 10-24 of 06 on this charge. But, uh, okay. But it, it, right, right, right. On the, on the distribution charge. Yes, sir. On the distribution, but you were already in jail. Okay. Yeah, right. I got Because I, I, I think that, uh, well, I don't know, but the buy took place in, in March of 06. Right. I didn't get arrested. I was already yeah. in March of 06. You said you got arrested in May of 06. Yeah, I got, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got arrested on a DWI in May of 06. So uh, when, uh, when, I, when they served in, uh, the indictment on the on, on the distribution, I was already in jail on the DWI. Okay, yeah. Let's speak about your DWI. That was your second DWI. The first was in 2000. Right. Yeah, uh, no. And yeah, what was going on? What's, what's going on with that DWI? Yes, out, you know, I was out partying and, uh, you know, just got caught up, you know. Yeah. Um, doing, you know, I was out doing the wrong thing, you know, and uh, I was drinking and driving. Do you, uh, do you think you need any kind of substance abuse treatment? Well, uh, I got substance abuse treatment. Uh, I take, I take substance abuse classes uh, in here. What you took? I took uh, living in balance and uh, celebrate recovery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in twelve step, in twelve step program. So, if you were successful today, how you plan on staying clean and sober? Uh, meetings, going to meetings, and uh, working my, uh, working the program. I go, uh, I'm gonna be a, going to church because my sister's a, a, my sister's a minister, you know, and then I'm gonna be, uh, uh I plan to be, uh, uh. uh Associating with uh, Pastor Mims at uh, at his church, and you know I'm just going to associate myself with uh, you know positive people doing positive things, and you know I, I got a uh, I got a, a religious background. My mother, you know, my sister's a minister, and my mother, you know, was like uh, uh, you know. A, Okay, I I I, I, I I get that. I get that. But how is that going to keep you clean and sober? Uh, I'm going to hang around them and not hang around, you know, uh, users and, and drug dealers and stuff, you know? You said something about going to meetings. What what, what you mean by that? Uh, 10 a.m. meetings. How many would you attend? 
as many as possible, you know, uh, when I'm not working, but I intend to be working. You so know. you had said it now, he hasn't, he hasn't said it. If I get out on parole, I'm going to attend X number of meetings a week. You, you haven't made that kind of a statement unto, to yourself. Well, I'm gonna attend as many as possible, so I don't know how I don't know how I'm gonna be working, you know, Miss Pearl. Okay. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I can't say how. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna attend because I don't know when I'm gonna be working. I might be working a day. And I'm I, I, working. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I do. I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm gonna attend, I'm gonna attend as uh, often as possible. Okay, but uh, but I but I also I want you to understand what I'm saying. Well, what I'm hearing you say with, with TW, two, two DWI history, uh, distribution of cocaine, life sentence, work is coming first. Meeting is going to come after work. And that's what I'm hearing that you see. Well, you know, once, once I'm out there in the world, I ain't going to be, I mean, ain't nobody going to be taking, I'm going to have to take care of myself. I understand, you know, I mean, I understand that. I, I understand that. Uh, my I understand that, but I just want you to know that's what I that's what I hear. That's what I hear you saying, and that's concerning for me. That could be because you, if you don't stay clean and sober, you'll be back here. You'll be back where you are now. And, and I'm just putting it out there. There's something you to think about. Let's let's talk about a few other things. Um, tell us about your write-ups. How many write-ups have you had in uh, in these two, 15 years and eight months incarceration? Uh, I'm not really sure. I had uh, quite a few when I was in Angola. Yes. Uh, when was your last one? Do you remember your last one? I think my last one was uh, about two and a half years ago. That's at 2021 uh, for the aggravated disobedience? Yes, ma'am. What was that about? What was going on? Well, uh, I was uh, in my at my bed doing some legal work because I, you know, I was working on my case and I had mm -hmm. legal work spread out and I had, it was an empty bed in front of my bed. So I uh -huh. laid, laid my legal work on that bed because, you know, and uh, the officer came through at the time and, uh, you know, uh, but she had came through before and told me not to lay anything on the bed and I tried not to, but I guess happened to have to go in my locker and I laid it there for just a minute and and, you know, next thing I know, she came through and, uh, you know, she told me she had told me not to uh, put anything on that empty bed. So she wrote me up for aggravated disobedience. Okay. And then before that, you had a defiance in 2020. What was that about? Defiance? Yes, sir. I can't remember that. Uh, okay. I can't remember. In 2020, let me see. Uh, might have been. Was that a... Oh, that, that might have been. Uh, you that way, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, I remember that. Yeah. It was a misunderstanding, but, you know, it was it was a misunderstanding about uh, some uh, some some clothes that uh, somebody I was trying to do something about a favor. They they came by, brought some laundry for somebody else, and I was, I got, I grabbed the uh, the dude, the dude was going to lunch, that the laundry, the laundry belonged to, so I was gonna take it in there and put it on the bed because I, it was, it was, I was trying to go to get the lunch myself that day. I think they were having chicken and child, so I didn't mm -hmm. want to miss. I was kind of late, so I just okay. grabbed, I grabbed the clothes and took them in there, and uh, when I was coming back out, he uh, uh, this, uh so Kennedy asked me uh, what that was I had in the back. I said it was some clothes for the dude and shit and stuff. So he told me to go back and get it, you know. So you know, I mean, I know him, so I thought he was, you know, I really thought he was just kind of messing with me, you know. I didn't think he was that serious, so I told him, man, I gotta go and eat, you know. Stay in there, you know. So I went on and ate, and I came back, you know. He was writing me up. Oh, okay. Then I mean, in 2019, you had a fail. A theft charge. You remember what that was about? Theft. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. The number twenty-two. What also wrote that up? Oh, I don't. I don't know. You have to tell me. Oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, Miss Ross. <laughs> 
Yeah, Ms. Rawson, uh, I got some, uh, well, Ms. Rawson, the past kicking off, she's sitting here today, you know, uh, and I uh, I went I went in to see her, I went in the office to see her, and uh, he, he used to keep a, a, a bowl of candy on her desk. I mean, it's for, you know, visitors to take one, you know, when they, you know, I mean, it's, it's for people to take, you know, and I guess uh, I took too many. You know, I mean, she had some lemonades now. I guess I took a few. I, I took a few too many, and uh, she happened to miss them when she came back. You know, and uh, I was going by that time. I was going back to the dorm, and they called me back down there. And you know, I told her I had. I still had the lemonades in my pocket. I said, "Yeah, I mean, I thought you know, uh, it was all right for me to take a few." You know, so. That was that, huh? That was yeah, that. Yeah, I guess. I uh, guess. You smiling now thinking about them lemon heads. Boy, you should enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, you smiling now. Still yeah, about I mean, yeah, I guess took too many. You know, I took I took a few, but I took a little few too many. Too many, know? yeah. You was excited about lemon heads. And you had one contraband back in 2016. I think you had one in 2009, too. What was the contraband? Do you remember? Uh, contraband, uh, 2016? Mm-hmm. Oh, that might have... Uh, who wrote that up? She hasn't got it. Uh, you know? I don't know. 2016, I can't remember back then. Oh, okay, okay, that's all right. Been, uh, what is it for, a razor? Yeah. 2016. Yeah, I think you had one in 09, too, a contraband, too, so I don't know which one you might be thinking about. Yeah, it wasn't uh, It wasn't no drugs. It was, uh, I think, uh, the contraband was. might have been a razor. Mm -hmm. I had a, a, a razor out the uh, out the uh, case. I think the one you know in 2016 might have been. A, I think if I can remember right, okay. it might have been a razor I had out of the. Uh, I was cut trying to cut something with. You know, I took it out the case and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that other one back in uh, 2009. Oh, man. Uh, Back in 2009, I think that might have been. Oh, I can't remember. I really can't remember. Okay. Okay. We'll move on. It wasn't no drug though, because I ain't had no drug offense, no type of drug offense at all. In the whole, yeah. I haven't had any types of drug offenses in the whole uh, 17 years I've been incarcerated. No dirty urine or anything. Okay. It, wasn't, okay. it wasn't drugs. So when did you find out, Mr. Lewis, that you were going to have a hearing? Uh, in uh, in June, June of this year, yeah, man, June of 2023. That's when you found out, yeah, man. Uh, did you feel like you were ready? Yes, okay. Um, as uh, have you thought about uh, the impact of your drug dealing on your community? What have you come up with? If you thought about it, what did you come up with? Yeah, I, I, I had a, I know I had a negative impact. You know, I mean, the, the you know the, uh, the people I was selling it to, you know, uh, probably uh, I know they did. You know, might have burglarized, or you know, I mean, it might have they might they might have they committed crime because you know to get the drugs. You know, I mean, so I know I had a negative impact on the community. So how long were you a drug dealer? Well, I've really been doing it, uh, you know, for quite you know off and on. You know, I mean, for quite some time. You know. Uh, 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, what would you say? I say about uh I really started like in around 90 something, you know? In the then, 90s, okay. Yeah, around 90 something. And uh I, I went to jail in 95. And then uh I went back to jail again in 90. I got out in 98 and went back to jail again and uh, 2000, you know, I guess, you know, I, I've done it, you know, off and on, you know, since, yeah, since early, early 90s. Yeah, 1992 seemed like that was your first arrest. 
uh, involved. Well, when you had possession in uh, marijuana in 87. But okay, okay. Uh, so if you're successful today, tell me what are your plans? Where would you live and how would you support yourself? Uh, I'll probably live with my mother uh, uh -huh. temporarily. And then uh, when I uh, get the job, I'm gonna get my, I, I have a, I have a, a trailer. I have a, a spot of land my grandfather left me and okay. uh, I got a trail on it now, but you know, it's been sitting there for, for 17 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, it might not be no good. So I might have to uh, probably try to find me another trailer to, to put on that spot, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's why I'm gonna live. Okay. Then again, you know, I don't know how long I'm gonna live with my mother. But uh, my mother's, uh, she's getting up in age. She's 80 years old now. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she's by herself. Uh, she raised my son, my youngest son, uh, got married a few uh, a few months ago. You know, she's been had him uh, for the last uh, about 12, 13 years, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, now he's gone. She's there by herself. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I gotta get out there to take care of her, help take care of her, because, you know, I mean, she's been there for me, you know, I mean, every, all these uh, six incarcerations I've done, you know. Good, good. And you have two other children, uh, so what, what's the status of the other two children? The record said you have three. Yes, I have three. Uh, I don't really, uh, I mean, I don't really know, I don't really, uh, I'm yeah, saying, I'm saying, how many, think, how many mothers is that? No, three children. How many mothers is that? Three. Okay. Three different baby moms. Okay, then. Okay. I was, I in, contact, I was in contact with them, my, my other two kids uh, a few years ago, but, you know, they kind of, I guess they kind of lost, you know, uh, confidence in me. You know, they uh, lost interest, you know, I mean, they. I'm saying, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's hard. You know, incarceration is hard. It's hard. Everybody deals with it differently and have to find a way to survive, you know. Right. Everybody, everybody deals with it differently. Um, so what do you do every day now in the prison? Well, uh I'm a, I'm a, I work in the I'm a, I work in the field. You work in I'm, the field? Yes, I'm a uh, I'm a, I'm on a big strike in the field crew. Okay. Okay. But uh, the field don't go out, so I, I'm not like a temporary dorm or like in, in a healthcare or for the uh, I, I live in a, uh, a handicapped dorm. Mm -hmm. I, I help clean the dorm up and uh, help take care of the handicapped guys in there. So, what's your trustee status? I don't have a trustee status. Why not? Oh, because you probably because you like sentence them. Okay. Well, 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 I try. I thought I tried to get it once, but uh, uh -huh. well, I talked about trying to get it, but but they at the time, you know, they wasn't. Uh, they didn't think uh, I was ready for it, so mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. they ain't really trying no more. You know. Okay. Yeah. 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 Write up something. Write up something. I ain't having no write ups. Uh, you know, you know, over two and a half. Twenty twenty one, yeah, yeah, twenty twenty one. Yeah. All right, Warren. Uh, thank you for answering my questions, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis. Warren, what can you tell us about Mr. Lewis? Uh, yes, ma'am. The reason he didn't know, know about this hearing until June was because he's under that uh, at one uh, or four hundred one from two thousand and twelve, and he had not met the criteria until he reached his, I uh, believe it was 60th birthday, and that reduced his Tiger score to a low score. Before that, it was a moderate. So that's yeah. why he, his hearing date, or his actual pro eligibility date is in November of 22, but he did not become actually eligible and meet the criteria until this year, of June of this year. Um, he does work with our, uh, the handicapped dorm, and he helps helps out with them by taking them places and uh, and he's not, you know, he's not, he does have disciplinary write-ups, but he is not a disciplinary problem here at Wade. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 
Okay. Now we'll hear from your supporters. Uh, let's uh, hear from uh, your mother, Miss Joyce Lewis. I kind of told it there to you all, but just in case I get it, I'm going to uh, submit it. Do you want to hear her? Can you hear her? Ms. Lewis? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay. I have a letter that I want to submit this morning. I have sent it in to, to the... Huh. Yes, ma'am. We, we have the letter, we got the letter, the type letter. We got that. Oh, you got that? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma we did. Okay. Well, can it, it's all right if I read it again? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it was said, Farmer, Louisiana, uh, Post Office, July 423, July 14th, 2023. Attention, Louisiana Board of Parole. I, I also wrote it to the Board of Pardons. Post Office Box 94304, Capital Station, Van Ruiz, Louisiana. 708049304. And dear sir, greetings to you. I am writing this letter in reference to my son Carlos Teron Lewis, DOC number 102982, who is housed at David Way Correctional Center in Homa, Louisiana, 1740. I am asking the board to please consider and grant his parole. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That Carlos has had plenty of time to both think and regret the wrong things he has done by granting him his freedom. He can be a powerful witness to others so that they will not make the same mistake that he has made, but instead choose a better path by making a better choice, he will be able to take a stand and tell others how his bad choices plus bad decisions equals to life-changing consequences that were also bad. Since he has been incarcerated, two of his grandchildren that he has never seen has been born, and he has a new daughter-in-law he has never met. We are all anxiously looking forward to being reconnected with him and praying that you do the same way we do. His two sons, his two sons, daughter, sister, and church family will all be in your debt. Although the COVID virus has kept us at a distance, Carlos and I have never stopped praying over the phone together. Through prayer, he has been given a new mindset. He has taken a train to prepare for his release. I recently turned 80, and I would love to spend time with, him, with my son and to see him sit in church and and hear his son play a organ and sing while I still have time. God is able to work through peace to others. I am a living witness in what he can do. And I believe in Matthew 19 and 26, with God, all things are possible. Thank you in advance. Gratefully, George K. Lewis. I am submitting this letter. Thank you, Mr. Bush. We appreciate your comments. Now we'll hear from Ms. Sharon Brown. Okay. Hi. How are y'all doing today? Hello. We can't hardly hear you, Miss Brown. Brown. We can't hardly hear you. Yes. How are y'all doing today? Fine, thank you, ma'am. Tell us what you'd like us to know about your brother. 
Okay, first of all, my name is Sharon Brown. I'm uh, Carlos's oldest sister. I'm the pastor. Uh, I would just like to say, first of all, Carlos has been incarcerated for over half of his life. I believe that after the things he's gone through, the things he's experienced, that he has a lot that he can give our youth. The youth are looking for mm -hmm. a message. They're looking for something that can uh, give them hope for a brighter future. They're looking for something or somebody to speak something into their lives that they can be here and believe. Okay. Slogan that choices plus an outreach ministry calls choices plus decisions equal consequences, which will not might not could be eternal salvation or eternal damnation. I would like for my brother to take or uh, be a part of that ministry in reaching out to others, uh, in reaching young people. Our young people need to be reached. I think that after serving time at Angola was a life-changing experience for anybody. I pray that on this day, you will hear his words, uh, the words of those that are speaking on his behalf, and grant him the opportunity to make a difference in society. Uh, we need young men that have a past that can talk to our young people, not just with words, but with experience. I thank you for this opportunity uh, to share with you. My brother is my brother, uh, and we I love my brother, and we all love Carlos, and we all want to see him come out and be productive in society. Uh, some people need a, a show and tell. Some people need to see a miracle. Some people need to see change before they can actively make change. And I believe that Carlos is that catalyst that we need in our society today for change. We are asking the parole board to grant him the opportunity to make a change for our young people. Thank you, Ms. Brown. We appreciate your comments, ma'am. Now we'll hear from uh, Michael Mims. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Michael Mims. I'm a minister there at New Living Word Ministry located in Ruston, Louisiana. And we've been coming to Wade almost 20 years. And uh, just to note, I, I was incarcerated for Wade for like six and a half years, the little time in Angola. And uh, God has changed my life. But uh, I've been knowing Carlos about I think five, six years, he started coming to our, our, our ministry. And we just don't preach, you know, just hoop and holler. We, we try to teach people life skills along the way. And uh, Carl has been coming to our, our ministry for like five, six years. And one thing that impressed me about him, that uh, when the pandemic came, they stopped us from coming. And when we started back, a lot of uh, offenders stopped coming. They, they, what we thought were dedicated, they stopped coming. But Carl was one of the guys that he was consistently came hardly ever miss, you know, and I just like to say that uh, we do, we have three houses, and I, I made this uh, known to Carlos and Russell you know, that we house a friend, we, we get job, give them jobs, we have daily meetings with them, and, and then we counsel those uh, guys, and uh, one thing, uh, we know that Carlos needs support system, and sounds like he got a good good family, but he needs other people around us like us, and we're happy in that area. If he like to come stay or he just want to come visit us. But I, I think he'll be a good candidate for parole at the business. You know, I, I've been incarcerated. I've been around people, been locked up. And, uh, you know, when people hang around the word, the word changes, you know. And, and he's been hanging around the word. And uh, I think he got a good support system. I just pray that y'all give him an opportunity to get back out of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Mills. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Lewis, is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> I just want to say uh, 
uh, I pray that you all, you all will give me an opportunity for freedom. And if uh, I am released, I plan to, uh, you know, attend my meetings and hang around, uh, do positive things for the community, and 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 have to take care of my mother, uh, and 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 be there for my grandkids. Uh, I had while I while I was in Angola, I earned a welding a welding trade. So I'm a certified welder, and I I know uh, I can go out there and get a good job, making good money, and I won't have to you know try to do nothing illegal to, to get things I need. And uh, I, I like welding, and uh, I'm pretty good at it. So I you know I mean I, I know I can get a job you know uh, doing that, and so. Uh, you know, I won't have to do anything illegal to make money anymore. I guess free that uh, you all will give me an, another chance at freedom. And uh, I know uh, I know I can do right. And uh, I, I won't I won't be back anymore. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Panel ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Wise? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lewis, I, I, I just want to tell you, uh, quite frankly, you didn't impress me with your interview, with your answer. I don't know if you were nervous or, or what. That's why I asked you how long you prepared for the day. You, you really didn't. Uh, but the warden said you were not a disciplinary problem. That's what the warden said. You have good community support, good family support. Uh, I, I'm taking a chance on you because of your mother. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, so my vote is to grant after you complete uh, some kind of substance abuse program set forth by DOC. Uh, I agree with what your sister said. You do have a testimony that may help somebody, but but the way you presented today, I don't know how you're gonna, you're gonna help anybody. Uh, you, 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 didn't, you weren't very convicting to me. And I, that's why I want you to complete some substance abuse treatment so that you can get some education on how to help somebody else out there. Uh, and then you can see the other side of your drug dealing. And I want you to perform eight hours of community service a month, uh, be random drug screens by PNP, and uh, do at least three AA and eight meetings a week. That's a priority. Go to your meetings a week. That's how you stay clean and sober. But I'm just one vote. That, that's my vote. I'm just taking a chance on you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Uh, Freeman. Uh, Six felony offender. I, I, I have the same concerns as Ms. Wise, but I'm also going to take a shot on you. And uh, I'm, I'm just hoping you've grown tired of staying in prison. So I, I vote to uh, grant with the same condition. Mr. Lewis, uh, you've got some good family support. That's a good thing because I agree with Ms. Wise. It's your mother that pushed me over the line. Uh, you've got some work to do, and uh, I hope that uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you as well. My vote would be likewise to grant after you complete a uh, substance abuse program in the Department of Corrections. So, you've got three votes to grant. Good luck to you. Thank you. That was the very anticlimactic. Thank you. Uh, we've seen a lot of different reactions to someone being, what is a smile? Getting uh, granted parole. Keep in mind, he had a life sentence. A life sentence. So some people have told me that after all that time in prison, you just learn to keep a poker face, and maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's just not very um, charismatic. You know, I do have to give Miss uh, Wise credit, credit where it's due. She, I have not seen her touch her phone uh, in what's like five hours of hearings today. She's Maybe she's read the comments. She put her, I mean, she's not on it. It's incredible. And I, I think it's showing she's, uh, 
kind of seeing different interaction. Uh, that was interesting. She's like, I, I didn't think you did well today in your parole hearing. And it was kind of a, yeah, I mean, it wasn't an impressive hearing. Imagine getting the write up though when he started. The most he got lit up, I felt, was when he was started talking about the candy. Imagine getting written up for taking too much candy. Lemon heads. They are good. I, uh, what I thought was interesting about this case, I mean, I'm just not going to go down it for so much details. Um, You know, what's interesting is there was another hearing on the docket that it looks like they skipped. And that's that's interesting. But we'll have one more hearing today. And um, we'll finish off with it when they're ready. Uh, but the they use like a professional uh, um, informant. And an informant that they apparently have been using all the time, like for hundreds and hundreds of cases. And uh, they gave this informant like $800 of buy money to buy from him. And he did. He, you know, bought it from him. And then they waited like two months before they made the arrest because this informant was so effective for them. They didn't want to blow up his spot. So, uh you know, they waited a long time. It wasn't like they did an arrest right there in the spot. They just, they had recording devices and they were watching it happen. But they noted in here that they never recovered. The the buy money was not recovered. So it goes into all that cost of, of locking up these dealers and plus the $800 buy money. Man, um... They tried basically in his case because he had like gone out of it out of sight for like two minutes. So like, how do you actually know that he did the buy if he was out of sight for two minutes? But they, they had nothing. And uh, basically, of course, he was found guilty. And then they, they gave him the habitual offender charge. And uh, it does drive me nuts when you see people who are just sentenced to these life without parole. And then, you know, it's reversed because of the laws. But I, I think I would think that he would qualify for the Louisiana parole project, right? Am I am I wrong here? But I think because of his terms, um, he seems like someone he could use that. Yeah, he's you know, this was he really had no, no, uh, but imagine that, you know, two months later you get arrested for doing, for doing like a transaction all that time ago. The surprise you must have be like, what? Um, his criminal history commenced in 1980 with convictions for simple burglary. He also had a 1982 conviction for attempted possession, 1992 conviction for attempted distribution, 1993 for aggravated assault, 1994 for uh, attempted distribution, 1996 of possession of a firearm with a convicted felon, two convictions in 03 for distribution, variety of misdemeanor offenses. In each case, the defense was placed on probation or parole. His supervision ended unsatisfactory. In each case, where it was, I mean, yeah, he was, he's been in and out his entire life. It's, it is what, but still the idea that you would give a 44 year old man a life sentence, it's, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. And they realized that and that's why he has a chance of parole, but serve all this time and we, and just so sick and tired of seeing where these roaches uh, get nothing. So 2006, he's been locked up, what is that, 4, 10, 17 years. 
I'm glad they gave him a chance. 136. Our next uh, case is Mr. Eric Payne. Mr. Payne, would you give us your full name and DOC number, please? Uh, Eric. Dun yes, sir. Yes, sir. Eric, Eric Darnell Payne, 020AA7. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. And then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our procedure? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Eric D. Payne, DOC number 420887, uh, date of birth May 13th of 1981. He's classified as an 11th felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of March the 27th of 2024, an adjusted good time date of December the 27th of 2038, and a full term date of March the 27th of 2039. He is currently serving a 20 year sentence on the charge of obscenity after having been adjudicated a third offender. Uh, is that uh, sound correct, Mr. Payne? Yes, sir. Mr. Payne, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll begin our interview process. Mr. Payne, how old are you, sir? I'm 43. And how long have you been in prison on these charges this time? Uh, like four years and some. Okay. Let me ask you, Mr. Payne, how have you ever calculated how long in your life you've spent either in jail or in prison? Yes, sir. How, how many years have you spent in prison? Most of my whole life. When, when, did, when did you first go to prison? When I was like 14 years old. Uh, how far did you go in school? Um, I want to say like the ninth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. Okay. And why did why did you quit in the ninth grade? I'm gonna be honest with you, uh, sir. I mean, I just I just I just stopped going. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Where were you living when you quit school? Who were you living with? I was living with my grandmother. What did you do when you quit school? I mean, I I, I mean, I, I was. What, my, what, what, we know, I know you can steal my record day. I got a drug, I got a couple of drug charges too. And I, I was selling drugs. Did you ever, have you ever had a real job? That, like work, go to work at the 7-Eleven or Burger King or anywhere like that? No, sir. How did you make a living? Selling drugs? Selling the little drugs here and there, yes, sir. Tell me why you're in prison now. Do you know? Uh, yes, sir. Tell me why. For obscenity. Well, well, tell me about that. Have you given any thought to that? Why? Why do you continue to to do that? I mean, you've been caught at least three times. Uh, yes, you're sir. adjudicated a third uh, offender uh, for obscenity. So tell me, tell me what prompts you to do that? At the time, sir, I mean, I was really acting with, I had lack, of, I really had no self-awareness and I was acting with that basic self-awareness. I mean, I was, I really didn't even know myself. I had no expectations, no, no, uh, no business, no, no, no responsibilities to being committed to being responsible. I mean, I was just acting without basic self-awareness. Like I never had time to really get to know myself. But since I've been incarcerated this time right here, if you if you ever look and see all the times I've been incarcerated, it's been for like nine months or a year, stuff like that. That I really never had time to really just get to know myself. I really never had time to get to know myself and you know this and find out what's more important to me of the things that I value. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about what you've done while you've been in prison. Uh, 
uh, had had I, I know you're trying to get into some literacy programs. Have you been able to get into any programs that will help you learn how to read and write? Well, I'm still trying to get in school right now. I'm on the waiting list. I've been trying, I've been on the waiting list for like a couple of months now, but I'm still waiting. I'm still willing to wait. And if I gotta wait to, to for y'all to make a better decision or this to help my, my situation come out in a better outcome, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for me to make my situation better. Like I'm still trying to get in that, that process too. To get in school, I'm still is this trying to the get longest, in school. Is this the longest term you've ever been in prison at one stretch? Yes, sir. This time right here. You know, you've got, I've looked at your record. I mean, you've got at least 12 felony convictions. You've been arrested over 40 times. You have four obscenity charges. You have a number of property crimes. You've got several escapes. You've got some drug charges. You've got an indecent behavior charge, kidnapping, a number of driving offenses. And almost every time you've been out on supervision, you got revoked. I don't, I don't have no decent behavior charge. Not well, you know, were arrested for that. They may have not charged. Yeah, yeah, you they, may they, have they, not they, been convicted of that, but you got arrested for that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was. So tell tell me tell me why all of those crimes? Did you you said you sold drugs? Did you use drugs? I mean, I I, I smoked marijuana and, and pop ace pills. That was most of the. Drug, the only drugs I ever used in my life. Well, how often were you using those drugs? Like, on a daily basis, it's sometimes. Oh, every day? You were smoking marijuana every day? Yes, sir. What kind of pills were you popping? I, I took ACE pills, but before I was incarcerated, I, I really wasn't taking them like talking about it. When was the last time you took any kind of pills? It was probably like, probably like, a, I probably, well, I'm not going to lie. I think it was, it was, it was, it was, it was probably like a little bit before I was incarcerated. I so you were still doing about. pills and smoking marijuana when you came to jail the last time? Yes, sir. So how how do you intend on if you were to get out? How can what are you going to do to make sure you don't go back to smoking marijuana and popping pills? Well, I'm just gonna I'm gonna be a productive person, but I know like so far as me smoking marijuana and ace pills, I mean I, I got enough mind control and self awareness not to even go back to doing that though. Right. It sounds like you've taken some classes and you've learned some keywords to, 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 to mention to us. And, and that's good. I think you, you're, you're on the right track, okay? Yes, sir. But what are you going to do to be able to stop smoking marijuana? I mean, what's your plan? What have you learned in any of the classes that you've taken that will make me feel comfortable that you're not going to go back out there and start smoking again? Well, I mean, I know not to, um, I know how to dodge our risk, like anything that they can bring me back, like uh, uh, that, that made me relapse. I know how to avoid it, but I mean, I, it really, I really never had no problem with not just with like with not just with relapse and on it. It just when I did it, it was a mind. It was just something I choose to do. But I know with my mind. Well, you said you didn't have any problem with relapsing. Uh, you just told me a minute ago you smoked marijuana every day when you were out. And then you, you admitted as you were thinking about it that you were actually popping pills until the day before you got in prison. So, I mean, you do drugs when you're not in jail, and that's probably part of the reason why you've had a lot of these, these criminal issues. Yes, sir. Have you ever had, do you take any kind of medication, prescription medication? No, no, sir. Not, have, not you ever, have you ever been evaluated to determine why you may have done some of the things that you were doing? No, sir. I mean, I had to learn on my own. I had to, I had to do my own several, uh, I had to evaluate myself because 
Uh, what did you hear nobody to, to help me evaluate myself? I had what have you what have you determined in evaluating yourself? What conclusions have you come to? Well, I, I came to the conclusion, the, like the things that made me do a lot of the things that I was doing because I had no self-awareness to think about my thought patterns. You know what I'm saying? And the things like I say that I value the most. What does it mean that you had no self-awareness? What does that mean to you? Well, I, I don't understand that. What does it, it mean that it, you didn't have any self-awareness? You clearly were in a car. You went to Super One. You were masturbating in the car. You left. You came back. I, I, I mean, what self-awareness are we talking about? What do you mean by self-awareness? What didn't you know? I mean, like, you realize that was wrong? You had been arrested three different times for very similar actions in the past. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, sir. I, I did know it was wrong. I'm not going to lie to you. So what does the self what does this self awareness the, mean? What does the that mean? Is, the, 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 I, I say the self awareness is like the 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 part that govern me of my my good conduct and my right my wrong conduct. It's like the thought process to really just think about it and what matter the most. And instead of thinking for a quick fix or a quick solution, it, I could have been thinking of the long term process of what I could have been doing for my future. It's like it's like a it's like a thought process to think about what really matters the most instead of just thinking about a quick fix or a quick solution or something like that. Though I never had, I never really knew how to think about my thought process. I was and just, so what what has made the change? How how what is it this time that you've been in prison for longer than you've been in before, according to you? What is it that has helped you change? Is it some of the programs that you've taken? You've taken a couple of programs. Did you get anything out of those programs? Anything in those programs help you? Yes, sir. I mean, I I, I didn't learn a lot from the pro uh, the programs and really just I've been before the programs. I've been just I read a lot of self help books and I've been evaluating myself from from day one because. Okay, well, let, let's talk a little bit about. Your your education. Can you read and write? Yes, I, I mean I can read, and I can I can a certain words I can't really spell too good, but I can I say I can read. I can read enough to to get by. Yes, sir. And and have you ever tried to get your GED? Well, I, I, I'm well, I'm on, I'm supposed to be on the waiting list. I took the tape. I took my tape test, and I've been placed on the waiting list. But I'm still on the waiting list. Like they, it should be on documents or whatever. Mr. Payne, if if where were you living four and a half years ago in nineteen in 2018 when you were arrested? Where were you living at? In 2018. Yeah, when you got it, when you got arrested, since you've been in jail, where were you living before you came to jail? You talking about what 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 city or my neighborhood? Well, I mean, were you living with in a house with a relative? Did you have your own place? Where were you living? I was living with a relative. Who was your relative? My brother. Your brother? Yes, sir. And what did your brother do for a living? Well, he, he used to work. He worked it on car, but, but, but I, I'm going to be honest with you, sir. I, I, I had a brother that did eight years in a federal penitentiary, but he didn't change his life now. He did eight years in Tensaw. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, talk about you. Where would you live if you're going to get out anytime soon? Where would you go live? Oh, I can go live with my dad, my uh, my brother, my sister. Well, I mean, are they willing to take you in? I mean, you say you can go. Do you have a plan? Have you talked to anybody? Uh, if we turned you loose tomorrow, where would you go? I, well, I, I got, I got, I got, uh, I got my brother. Uh, I got my, I got family members that you know. That I got family support. I got a lot of family support. That well, I, I hear that, but I don't see anybody here today speaking on your behalf. Why isn't anyone? Did, did your family know you had a hearing today? I mean, yes, yes, sir. They knew, but I figure, like you know. 
I feel like I just, my words should be good enough because they can say anything, but my conduct record and just me speaking alone would uh, be more valuable than what Mr. they can Mr. Speak. Payne, your criminal record is horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. Now, but the last four and a half years while you've been in prison, when you're in prison, it looks like you don't get in trouble. But when you're out, you do. Yes, sir. I, I, and I apologize for all my mistakes that I made in my life. But at the time, like I would say, I was younger on, on a lot of my charges. I was younger, but that's not a excuse. But like I say, my biggest problem was self-awareness. And, you know, some people we have, sometimes we have to evolve into conscious beings. Like everybody not born, born with a high, high level of consciousness. And sometimes we have to evolve to that level like that. Though. And I was one of them type of person that had to just Gordon, what can you tell us about Mr. Payne? Uh, Mr. Payne has, he arrived here in January of this year and he has taken the tab test and is on the waiting list for the literacy class. He's currently in, uh, enrolled in living in balance and victim awareness. He has completed risk management. He does not have a conduct record. He has not been um, a disciplinary issue. He uh, had a good work evaluation. He currently works in the kitchen here at Wade. He had a, a good uh, evaluation from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ford. Um, uh, that's all I have, sir. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Now, Eric, you said you left school in the ninth grade. Were you in regular classes or were you in special ed classes? I was in special ed. Okay, how long had you been in special ed? Do you remember? Yeah, since I've been in elementary, probably like since I was a little, a little okay. kid. Okay, was your, was your mother getting SSI for you? I mean... You're not sure? You're not sure? No, she she never started getting SSI, but her and my grandmother was trying to get it when I was younger, but like like I say, when I, once I turned 14, uh -huh. I was in and out of being incarcerated that I never stayed out long enough to, to get it, man. Anybody ever explain to you why you were in special ed? Did they ever tell you? I just, you don't remember what they said? I just knew I was a slow learner. I thought it was just for me being a slow learner. Okay, okay, all right. All right, but thank you for answering my questions out of here, Chip. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Payne, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before we vote? Um, I just say I just want to say my biggest problem was my self awareness, and I'm still in classes that I that I need to finish. And uh, if y'all if if y'all do grant my parole today, which I, I please wish y'all can, and if y'all got any classes y'all would like me to recommend, I mean y'all would like to recommend for me to finish. Uh, and I want to appreciate y'all for this opportunity. Thank y'all for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Payne. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Payne, uh, I enjoyed the interview. I think you've been honest with me as best you can be. Uh, I, I think that you're moving in the right direction. I think that uh, I'd like to see you be able to get into that literacy class. I'd like to see you uh, get your GED if you can. I'd like to see you take some more classes in in treatment regarding your substance abuse. You've got a significant substance abuse problem and you need to get a really good transition plan. I mean, you, you, you say I've got potentially places to go and live. You know, it's not easy taking someone in in their home and, and, and having them live with you. So you, you need a little more planning. You're, you're, you're moving in the right direction. I think, I think you need some, some, programs like maybe thinking for a change to, you know, you, you, you talk about your awareness, your self-awareness. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I think you're on the right track. And that is you need to look internally and try to figure out why it is you do what you do. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, I, I, I stole some property because I wanted some money to go buy drugs or, you know, I burglarized the house because I needed some money, you know, but this obscenity business that that you, you have a, a significant record of, 
uh, is, is more of an emotional, mental issue that you need to address. Yes, and I think that you need to get an evaluation. You need to make some determination as to what that is. And I'm not willing to let you out yet without all of that. Because if I do, I think you're just going to come right back in. And we want you to get out, but we want you to stay out. So my vote today is to deny, but to encourage you to kind of move forward. And I'm going to ask the warden, if it's possible, to get an evaluation for you and, and see if there's any specific classes that might help you come to a better awareness of what, especially the obscenity charges. Okay, That's my vote, but I... I'm denying you, but I'm encouraging you to keep working hard, okay? Ms. Wise? All right, uh, Eric, I do, I do too. Likewise, I appreciate the progress that you're making. I can tell that you're working hard. And you don't want to be the same person if you get out this time. And I do want to encourage you uh, next time that if your family want to come and be with you at the hearing, let them come. Uh, they, can, they, can, uh, they can speak to what's going on on the outside and what's available. You can only speak to what's going on on the inside. They can kind of verify some things for us. So if they want to be at the hearing, I just want to mention that to you. My, my vote is the same to deny. I, I don't think you served enough time on that 20-year sentence. Your criminal history, your level defender, you have high risk, and you really need to complete that literacy class. Um, and, and then there's a need for substance abuse treatment. And you have law enforcement opposition to your early release. Uh, best wishes to you, so please yeah, take advantage. You say, you say, what about the opposition? Law enforcement. We reach out to the law enforcement community in the parish where you got convicted, and we ask their opinion about early release. And a lot of them were against you getting out early. I just, I'm just putting that on the record. Thank Nothing you can do about that. It's just their opinion. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Mr. Uh, I concur with uh, my colleagues. My vote is to deny. Mr. Payne, uh, you've got three votes to deny, but I think we're all encouraging you to continue to work as hard as you're working because eventually you're going to be able to get out, and it, it may not be as long as you think. So try to get your try to get your uh, literacy work done. Try to get some more substance abuse uh, and get a, an evaluation. And, and when you're eligible again, reapply, and maybe you'll have a different verdict. But for today's purposes, your parole is to die. So good luck to you. All right. Appreciate y'all very much. Thank you. Right. Warden, thank you very much. We'll close out. Uh, the time is 1.59. Okay. Thank y'all. Have a good one. Man. Um, you know, he's, he's quite lucky he didn't get a, uh, a life sentence. This hearing was very interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to show it to, to you to this one. Uh, <laughs> what was interesting about this one? It just popped up because this was the last hearing of the day. On that note, it was a little uh, disappointing to see Ms. Wise pick up the phone after I had just complimented her for not picking up the phone. But she did do much better today than she had done really than I've ever seen her do. She, uh, I think, was making a very conscious effort to not be on her phone. Oh, come on. So, gosh, you know, the way that, that these websites are run are just so, and they wonder why they're failing. So a Shreveport man accused of doing this outside a local business and then attempting to coerce a witness was convicted Thursday a six-person jury, three men, three women, unanimously found Eric D. Payne of 38 years old, a Shreveport, guilty for the third offense of sanity and obstruction of justice. Prosecutors plan to seek the habitual offender sentencing for Payne. So when he returns to the district courtroom, he faces 20 years to life, which is interesting that he didn't get that life sentence, I guess. I mean, we see it all day long, but maybe because it's uh, 2019, they've changed the way they approach these things. Um, the jury selected Wednesday, and I think 20 years is fine, although there's this is there. This is scary, and I am very happy that, you know, Judge 
Maribella identified it and asked to get some type of special evaluation because, I mean, you read about these things and they typically escalate. So I don't know, you know, that's just, it always starts with like, you know, the little things and then you hear that often it escalates. But the jury selected Wednesday, Thursday, deliberated for an hour, you know, uh, basically long enough for them to get their lunch. The jury determined that on February 18th, he pulled his truck into a parking spot in front of a tax preparation business. Imagine that you're just minding your own business, preparing taxes, whatever, like uh, after calling attention to himself to a receptionist behind the glass front of the business, raised his hips and began to do that. The receptionist, poor thing, has to work in taxes and now see that, calls the police who apprehended pain before he could flee. They actually got there before he could run away. How is that even possible? They just happened to be in the area or did he sit there doing it? While incarcerated, awaiting trial, Payne phoned a third party and instructed him to offer money to the receptionist in an attempt to persuade her to not appear at trial or say he didn't expose himself. What? A, yeah, he's not the brightest tool in the shed. I believe we've clarified that. Uh, and But he was previously arrested for this, has convictions of this in 20, 2007-2014. Five prior felonies aggravated flight um you know it's just it's it's just scary i don't know what the psychological makeup of someone who feels that they need to do something like that where and that's three times that he got caught and you know mr marabella was trying to get down to the root of it and he just you know he's uh, he's just you know he's he couldn't even begin to kind of explain it and i don't know if i wrote this down right but 40 arrests 12 felonies and the indecent behavior which she was very adamant saying no, no no that didn't happen and i guess it was dropped and maybe this was one of those things that he did and they tried to tack him on with another charge but i mean it wouldn't surprise me at all I, someone it's like it's like uh there's, there's got to be something very wrong with you, right? <laughs> and, um, and like, you know, with with this track record, it, it is scary to me. Uh, he needs a lot of help. And certain, certain people do belong in prison for life. Um, I don't know if he is one of them, but I'd be terrified to parole him. Uh, and you just be afraid that, you know, but I, I think they made the right decision, of course. It's, it's you know, and to think that, Whatever he needs, someone needs to evaluate him. They need to know like what's going on, uh, and you know, uh, to truly understand. And then get him help, but it's just scary. I don't. I I throw my hands in the air. I don't know what you're supposed to do in these situations, except you got to keep you got to keep people safe, and. Uh, he literally pulls up in a truck and just whips it out in the middle of the day so that like what dude um i'm gonna cut this out and make this a separate upload as well so if you see it twice you'll know why but um like like i'm saying now if you didn't see it you wouldn't believe it and that's why we do this. So please do the YouTube thing. And with that, I'll let you go.